introduce in a moment. As you will see from the announcement that has just popped onto your screen, we will be recording this session. We've gotten a notice from some folks who wanted to attend, but weren't able to do so at this time. So we're going to be recording uh, the presentations so that they'll be able to watch them uh, at a later time. So before I uh, introduce Anjan and turn things over to him in a moment, I just want to uh, take a, a minute or two to explain what our schedule is for the next 90 minutes. So we will, um, um, so please during that time, if you would continue to keep your microphones muted, uh, I'll try to keep my microphone unmuted when I'm trying to speak. Um, and I want to encourage each of the speakers to do the same. But for the uh, audience members, if you would please keep your microphones muted, that will make sure that we um, don't have uh, background noise that interferes with the presentations. Uh, but also we encourage you to keep your cameras on. Uh, in a minute, uh, we will get started. And here's the way we will work. Uh, Anjan will uh, give a brief introduction to the Penn Center for Neuroesthetics, which he directs. And then he will introduce uh, two speakers to uh, new postdocs uh, who have just joined the center. They will each have 10 minutes to give a presentation and we'll have uh, about five minutes for questions or comments directly after that. If you have a question or comment, please put that in the chat and Anjan will field those and pass them along to the presenters. Uh, at that time, I will give, after the, the two uh, Penn Center for Neuroesthetics presenters have, have uh, given their talks, I will give a brief introduction to the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project and introduce two postdocs who will be presenting from our uh, project. Similarly, they will each have 10 minutes to present with five minutes of Q&A after each presentation. And uh, we encourage you to uh, chime in via chat if you have questions uh, or comments for each of them. Uh, at that point, we should have uh, some time for a, a general discussion among the speakers uh, on the topics presented, the overlaps uh, between them and so forth. So again, if you have comments or questions at that point, please uh, add them to the chat and Anjan and I will uh, facilitate uh, that. Uh, and again, we plan to uh, finish by 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so at this point, again, I wanna welcome uh, each of you uh, zooming in from wherever it is that you are. Uh, there are disadvantages and advantages to this, uh, the ways in which we must uh, connect these days. It would be nice to see your physical selves, um, although I'm mindful that if we had that requirement, many of your physical selves would not be able to attend. So uh, we appreciate you being here. Okay, so at this point, I will turn things over to Anjan Chatterjee. Anjan is the Elliott Professor of Neurology, Psychology, and Architecture, and the founding director of the Penn Center for Neuroesthetics at the University of Pennsylvania. Anjan and I have been collaborating for, I don't know, two, three years now, something like that, having very rich discussions uh, about uh, connections between the work that he's doing at the Penn Center for Neuroesthetics and our work at the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project. So Anjan, uh, welcome, and I will turn things over to you. Thank you, James. Um, it's really a delight. Uh, James and I have been talking about doing something in a more public setting for quite some time, and this is, uh, is finally coming to be. Um, I just wanna make one minor correction to what James said. I am no longer the Elliott Professor. Uh, that um, endowed chair came with being the chair of neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital, which I gave up in order to uh, direct the Penn Center for Neuroesthetics. But everything else you said is, is, is accurate. And just to give you a sense, uh, the, uh, you know, our goal is really to try to advance uh, the basic science of our understanding of the biologic basis of aesthetic experiences. Uh, that's the fundamental goal. Uh, we approach this through vision. Uh, you know, one can approach it through any sensory modality, but we think of aesthetics broadly in the context of people, places, and things, which is how the visual system carves out the world. And so we're interested in aesthetic experiences of people, of our environment, uh, and uh, objects, which can be the design of objects or the quintessential aesthetic object uh, people often think of as art. So broadly, that's our, our mandate. 
uh, but we're also interested in community building, uh, and that has uh, has to do with other groups on Penn's campus, like <clears throat> James's group, but also outside uh, Penn as well. We've had, uh, for example, someone who spent their sabbatical year here. Uh, you know, across the world, there are relatively few places uh, that focus on aesthetic experiences. And I think it's incumbent on those of us who care about this to find each other uh, as, as part of a general uh, community building enterprise. Um, I will also make one uh, announcement, which I think this is the first public announcement I'm making of this, uh, which is two years from now, uh, 20, uh, 22 in early September, we will be hosting the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics meeting. Uh, and we will be doing this in, uh, uh, along with the Barnes Foundation. Uh, it turns out it's the centenary of the Barnes Foundation. For those of you who don't maybe know who the Barnes Foundation is a very uh, well regarded, one of the most extraordinary private uh, art collections in uh, Philadelphia. Dr. Barnes, who was a physician who was actually trained at Penn, uh, was always very interested in the, the way science interacts with, uh, with art. And so the people at the Barnes Foundation feel like if he were alive now, he would be very uh, interested in neuroaesthetics. And so, so two years from now, early September, uh, for those of you who are interested in empirical aesthetics, uh, the major international meeting will be here. Okay, so moving on, uh, because you're not here, uh, you haven't uh, signed on to hear me talk. Uh, you know, I'm going to introduce uh, uh, our new postdocs. Uh, what this means is that the work they're going to present is what they did before coming here. This is not work they've done in the center. Uh, but it also gives you a, maybe a kind of a sense of the sorts of people we look for that bring uh, uh, sort of skills and knowledge uh, that uh, is, uh, is useful and, and synergistic when it comes to questions of aesthetics. So, and as James mentioned, they will be speaking for 10 minutes. Uh, and for trainees and senior people as well, you should know 10 minutes is a really hard talk to give. Uh, because you've got to get it, you know, you don't want to be vapid. I'm, I'm setting them up, which I don't want to make them even more nervous, but you know, you don't want to be vapid and at the same time, you don't have that much time. So we're going to start with Alex Christensen, uh, who uh, got his degree from the University of North Carolina. He worked with uh, Paul Sylvia, who some of you may know if you are in the world of aesthetics. Paul has done a lot of work on uh, some work on quantitative methods, but also on uh, personalities, uh, uh, differences, and what predisposes people to be engaged with aesthetics and so on. Uh, Alex uh, has special expertise in quantitative methods, uh, which will relate to what he's uh, going to talk about. Uh, but to give this a little more uh, texture, whenever we're talking about uh, aesthetic experiences or people's personalities and predispositions and even the brain, we're really talking about multi-dimensional factors, right? These are not simple one factor, one outcome uh, kind of research enterprises. And whenever you're dealing with something uh, that has that level of complexity, the, the question always is how do you deal with complicated data how do you reduce it without simplifying it uh, in a way that's manageable? Uh, and so, you know, most of the, the, the people in the audience will know of tried and true methods like principal components analysis and the way in which you take large data sets and try to uh, get some purchase on it. Um, and uh, Alex has been uh, at the forefront of developing uh, a slightly different way of approaching this, which is uh, sometimes referred to semantic network analysis or just network uh, science. Uh, and with that uh, brief introduction, uh, let me turn it over to you, Alex. Well, thank you, Anjan. I uh, really couldn't say it better myself. I think that's a, a perfect introduction and sets me up very well here. So uh, with that, I'll get my screen share going and 
hopefully you all can see the screen I have there. Um, so to start, thank you all for, for joining us uh, virtually and, and for those of you joining us perhaps later uh, with the recording, uh, I appreciate everyone coming in and, and welcome. I'm happy to, to kick things off here. So uh, as Anjan said, I'm gonna be introducing kind of a new way to um, estimate factors or estimate summaries basically of large sets of variables um, into more specific uh, phenomena that we're interested in. Uh, so very basically, we do factor analysis or we do principal components analysis because we want to summarize and explain the pattern of associations between variables. And the reason we do this is because uh, we want to determine scales or the multifaceted nature of the thing we're studying. It's also to derive scores uh, of an instrument. And then finally, uh, it's also to help inform psychological theory. And a lot of examples are in personality and intelligence, but as Anjan had mentioned, um, it's also in aesthetic uh, experiences. And so really over the last century, uh, principal components analysis, which I'll just call PCA, and factor analysis, which I'll probably refer to as FA at some point uh, during the talk here, these have really dominated the, the field uh, really for about 100 years at this point. And uh, simulation studies have kind of shown that PCA works better for unidimensional estimation or just one factor estimation, whereas factor analysis kind of works better for multidimensional or many factor estimation. And that these methods also tend to be better with continuous data versus polytomous data. And polytomous data is gonna be like your five point Likert scale uh, from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So in about the last uh, decade here, there's been uh, kind of a new arrival of network analysis, which to kind of break it down very simply, network analysis looks at variables or items in a scale as nodes, uh, which are represented by these circles. And then the uh, correlations or the associations between these variables are re represented as edges or these lines going between nodes. And as you can see here, this is a pretty basic and straightforward representation of a network, um, but these networks quickly get very complex. Um, and this uh, figure that I have on the right of your screen here is actually a, a network of the World Wide Web. So uh, it's obviously hard to tell or see, but the nodes here represent uh, hyperlinks or links to websites and all of that colorfulness uh, represents kind of the edges going between those websites. So with network analysis, we're actually able to estimate factors. And I've, with this example here, I've nicely arranged uh, a big five factor uh, scale for the big five uh, personality traits. And you can see that they arrange quite nicely into their kind of color, color coded traits. Um, like red is agreeableness here, yellow is conscientiousness. And what network, networks do very well is they kind of present uh, this information, um, not just between uh, the variables, but also the factors very neatly. And so one thing that we want to do, or one thing that we're able to do with these networks is kind is, is we're able to estimate these clusters. And these clusters um, often will have stronger uh, correlations going between them. So if we look at this network plot, the thicker the lines going between the nodes or the uh, items here, the more associated those items are. And so to pick up on these clusters in the network, we use what are called uh, community detection algorithms. And what these effectively try to do is maximize the connections within clusters and minimize the connections between clusters. And this actually really connects nicely with what Adam's gonna be talking about with modularity these uh, community detection algor algorithms are effectively what can help compute uh, modularity. And so some of the ad advantages, hopefully that are uh, somewhat apparent uh, with this network figure is that connections between variables are visible. This is something that you don't really get with um, PCA or factor analysis. Uh, variables are deterministically allocated into these factors. So that means that these algorithms actually decide which items go in which factor. So you're not doing that yourself. The algorithms actually do that. For people a little bit more familiar with factor analysis, 
uh, rotations are not needed. And these are typically uh, used to ensure that there are correlations between factors. So this is just removing one degree of freedom or researcher degree of freedom. And then finally, uh, simulation studies have demonstrated uh, as uh, equivalent performance or better performance using uh, these network methods than these more traditional methods. So previous research com comparing some of these community detection alg algorithms have really sparsely been ap applied. So in the psychological literature, there's been the spin glass algorithm and the walk trap, walk trap algorithm. I'm not going to get into these algorithms too much, but just know that there are multiple algorithms out there and really only a few have been used. And probably the closest thing to actually uh, like psychological factors in the literature are going to be comparing these algorithms with brain networks. Um, and from this, these simulation studies, there's been two that have been kind of recommended, the, the uh, Louvain algorithm and the walk trap algorithm. And in psychological factor data, um, in terms of simulation studies, only the walk trap algorithm uh, has been used in, in those studies. So that brings us to the goal of the present research, and that's to examine several of these algorithms in the iGraph package, which are all freely available uh, in R. And the, the goals are twofold. One is to compare the accuracy in estimating the number of factors in psychological data. And the other is to kind of is to uh, compare their precision in placing items in, in the correct dimensions. Because if you remember, these algorithms actually place these items into the factors themselves. So here are the uh, eight community detection algorithms that were used in the simulation study. Again, I'm not going to go into these in too much detail, uh, but just know that there are many different algorithms out there. And this, the goal of this is just to see which ones work best for identifying factors in networks. And here's the simulation design. Again, I'm not going to go too deep into the design here. Um, basically, we varied kind of every component of a typical factor model that we possibly could. Um, some key points here are looking at such things like sample sizes. We used a really small or what is actually probably a typical sam sample size in the psychological literature. Um, as well as looking at continuous and uh, polytomous data, like the five-point uh, Likert scale here. And for the analyses here, uh, of course, we wanted to have a benchmark comparison with uh, these traditional um, factor finding uh, analyses. So we used parallel analysis with principal components and factor analysis. And then the statistics that we use to actually quantify the performance here was the percent correct, or just the number of correctly estimated factors divided by the total number of data sets. And then also uh, specifically for the community detection algorithms, the item, item placement accuracy or the proportion, essentially the proportion of variables correctly placed into the true factor. So for the results, uh, there's, there's a lot to look at here. Uh, I have both continuous and polytomous data on the screen, but we'll just start by breaking down the continuous results here. So first, just looking at these uh, blue bars, this is going to be our uh, factor analysis, and this is our prin principal components analysis. And as you can see, these do very well, and if not, are performing uh, some of the best just across the board here. And we do have a few algorithms that are performing well uh, with the network data here. So we have the Louvain, the spin glass, walk trap, and the fast and greedy, or fast greedy. And these other algorithms really aren't performing uh, too well here. So uh, that's not a good sign for using those on your data. Um, flipping over to the polytomous data here, once again, just using the um, factor analysis and the PCA here. Uh, you can see that these, these accuracies have kind of gone down, at least relative to the community detection algorithms. And again, here we see some of the better performing ones, the Louvain, Walktrap, and Fast and Greedy are among the best performing algorithms again. So just to quickly point out here, this pretty large magnitude of a difference between the continuous and polytomous data. Uh, the polytomous data, again, the five-point Likert scale is very commonly used in psychology here. And so uh, 
when using these methods, we're actually not getting as good of results when we're estimating factors. So uh, these uh, network um, community detection algorithms would probably be preferred. Or preferred. Um, because I heard the timer here, I know that my time is about up. So I'll just quickly uh, kind of cover um, these results here. These are just the item placements for the top three community detection algorithms, the walk trap, Levain, Fast, and Grady. Um, I won't go over these results here just for the sake of time, but I do at least have a summary of what, what was found uh, in this large uh, graph here. Oops. Um, so just as a summary, the Louvain and the walk trap algorithms performed as well as these, these traditional methods, and they outperformed them uh, specifically with the Plitimus data. And for uh, item placement, actually, uh, these factor loadings, when factor loadings were small, sample sizes small, or correlations uh, between factors were large, the item placement was uh, not as uh, successful. All right, the big take home here, psychometric networks can estimate factors as well as principal components and factor analysis. They have some advantages uh, over these uh, methods that they should perhaps be preferred over them. And then finally, when using networks to estimate factors, the Louvain or walk trap algorithm uh, should be preferred. Um, at the end of my slides here, there's some resources. Um, this talk is under review. And if you're interested in applying any of these methods and are familiar with R, the EGNet, EGA net package is available on CRAM. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for, for listening. Great, Alex. Um, so I, I'm going to uh, read a question uh, that's in the chat, uh, which was, was polytomous data analyzed as polychoric? I don't know what that word means. Polychoric correlations, or did you assume they were continuous? Uh, we use polychoric correlations. So yes, we did use polychoric correlations are assuming that there's a normal distribution underlying the splits in the, um, in the ratings of one to five in this example. And yes, we use polychoric correlations. So one thing Alex is going to be working on uh, is on a, a, a grant that we uh, just received from the Templeton Foundation, which is trying to understand uh, a, a technical term from philosophy called aesthetic cognitivism, which is the basic proposition that aesthetic engagement with art enhances understanding. Uh, and so as you can imagine, what aesthetic engagement actually means, what understanding means. These are all, you know, multidimensional, complicated constructs with all kinds of theoretical baggage. Uh, but that's, uh, that's where uh, we will try to use some of these methods to disambiguate uh, some of these, uh, uh, these issues. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll make some headway there. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, we will have time to come back at the end uh, as you're cogitating over this and other questions arise and maybe in combination with some of the talks. Uh, so I'm going to now turn to Adam uh, Weinberger, who got his uh, PhD from Georgetown. Uh, he uh, worked uh, and continues to work with Adam Green, who some of you may know is uh, currently the president of the Society for Neuroscience of Creativity. Uh, Adam, as a grad student, managed uh, to, uh, was successful in being a co-PI on a grant with uh, also to the Templeton Foundation. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, people who do empirical aesthetics are always uh, a question that often comes up is what is aesthetics good for? Right? How do you, uh, you know, there's this desire to think of aesthetics as being intrinsically valuable and for its own sake. But when we make those claims, it's only other people who believe that that actually sort of nod. And, you know, so, uh, you know, so the question always for us is how do we, how do we make, how do we convince the unbelievers that uh, aesthetics uh, and aesthetic experiences are important? Uh, but one piece of that uh, is thinking of how it applies in other contexts. And right now we're in the midst of writing 
uh, an NSF grant, uh, looking at not aesthetics per se, but related to aesthetics, but how this applies in educational settings. Uh, and so in that context, I think what Adam is going to talk about is, uh, you know, broadly saying, how do we take these constructs from neuroscience, from cognitive neuroscience, uh, and uh, how do they apply in, uh, in a real world education setting? Uh, and so I will turn it over to you, Adam. Okay, uh, thank you, Anjan. Let me get this uh, set up here. Okay, that looks correct, yes? Yes. Okay, um, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, Again, so for today's talk, I'm gonna focus on results from an NSF funded project examining neural and behavioral data from a group of high school students before and after their senior year. I should just say at the outset, like most uh, large research projects, there are several questions from this data set that we're investigating. And what I'll be sharing today is just one such question. Um, maybe afterwards I can talk more broadly about the project. Okay. So it is now well established that the brain's functional network architecture uh, facilitates learning and recent efforts have sought to quantify and predict learning based on individual differences in network organization. Uh, of particular note, a number of recent perspectives, many of which have been provided by labs at Penn, have highlighted the potential use of using network science to develop biomarkers or frameworks of learning that are descriptive of brain processes underlying learning and also correlated with future capacity to learn across possibly a wide range of learning domains and conditions. Um, somewhat surprisingly though, these questions have not yet been extended to real world or classroom-based learning. So this question, whether we can use individual differences in brain network organization to predict classroom learning and achievement is the focus of what I'll be talking about today. Now there are a lot of candidate organizational principles that could be used to ask these kinds of questions but I was primarily interested in looking at modularity. So this will tie in nicely what, with Alex's talk, but just a brief background on kind of what I mean when I say modularity. So uh, broadly speaking, a modular network is defined as one in which network nodes are clustered into multiple distinct subgraphs or communities. Nodes within a subgraph are densely connected and communicate frequently, and those in different subgraphs uh, have sparser connectivity. So modularity therefore quantifies the extent to which a network exhibits this kind of segmentation. So the brain is considered to be one such modular network with nodes in this case referring to specific brain regions and connectivity based on functional associations or functional connectivity. Prior work has indicated that modularity supports learning uh, because these organizational principles provide the capacity to adaptively reorganize subgraphs in the presence of new information or experiences. So the idea here is that neuronal populations that are not specialized to respond to an input can remain detached from the learning process while the task relevant networks can reconfigure. So in this way, a modular network allows for new connections to form without necessarily disrupting old ones. In support of this line of thinking, a small but consistent collection of work has found that whole brain modularity is associated with intervention-based improvements in cognitive functioning, particularly for older adults and patient populations. So this kind of work uses whole brain modularity, which is obtained prior to the start of some sort of intervention to try to predict individual differences in training gains. There's also some work to suggest that modularity may be a marker of general or fluid intelligence, but none of this work has extended these findings to classroom-based learning or achievement, which takes us to the current study. So in this study, participants were scanned before and after their senior year of high school. One thing that I have not yet mentioned is that half of the students in this study were enrolled in a specialized course designed to improve spatial reasoning abilities. So we can think of these uh, students as like the intervention group and comparing behavioral and neural changes in this group relative to controls, uh, so the students that were not enrolled in the course, was one of the main objectives of this research project. But again, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna kind of focus on the modularity question. Um, suffice to say that the students enrolled in this specialized course showed significant improvements on the uh, spatial reasoning measures that we had them complete uh, from time one to time two, while the controls did not show 
at that level of improvement, so the intervention appeared to be successful. Um, what is most important for the purposes of this talk, though, is to understand that when I'm referring to learning, I'm referring to the extent of this improvement from time point one to time point two. Okay, so uh, during the visit, participants completed a spatial reasoning task, uh, which is related to the things they learned in the course, as well as a short resting scan. So the key questions here are thus, uh, is modularity altered by task demands? So what I mean by this is, do we see differences in modularity during task and during rest? I also wanted to know if individual differences in modularity at time point one would be associated with differences in learning. So for this question, I focused only on the students that were enrolled in the specialized course and like prior work, tried to use their modularity prior to the intervention to predict how much improvements they had in the course. And then my third question was whether modularity relates to academic achievement. So this is fairly straightforward, just looking at modularity as it uh, associates with uh, GPA. Okay, so moving on to the results. So the first question was asking about whether the modularity is altered by the task. And as indicated by this figure, the answer appears to be yes. So the resolution parameter, which is something I have along the x axis here, is something that was used in the calculation of modularity to allow us to estimate communities of different sizes. Um, but what's important to know is basically across all the different scales and sizes, uh, the average modularity for the full sample at rest was higher than what we saw during task. This is consistent with prior work and seems to indicate that when completing a complex uh, cognitive task, there may be some sort of departure from a more basal modular state. Uh, in other words, there's more communication between brain regions that may otherwise be more segregated. For the remainder of the analyses that I'll be presenting, I'm only going to be focusing on the modularity that was obtained during the reasoning task. Uh, this is for a few reasons. The resting scan was fairly short, so we're, there's some questions about whether uh, functional connectivity has stabilized. And also, more practically, we didn't see anything with the resting data, so you can just kind of assume that there's a null result from the resting data to go along with everything else that I'm presenting. Okay, so our second question was asking if modularity was associated with uh, learning. So we asked whether modularity scores at the first visit could be used to predict the extent of learning in the intervention group of students. Um, again, learning in this case refers to improvements in the spatial reasoning tasks that they completed in the scanner as well as development of spatial habits of mind. So spatial habits of mind, we assessed outside of the scanner with a questionnaire. Um, and this basically assessed the tendencies of students to use spatial information while problem solving. And this is a direct measure of the kind of tendencies that were fostered by the course. So you can think of it as uh, the extent to which students learn the course goals and objectives. And what we can see here is, although there's you know, clear differences, individual differences in modularity, in contrast to our prediction, there's actually not a relationship between modularity prior to enrollment in the course and the amount of learning that those students um, had. So basically modularity was not associated with changes in spatial reasoning or the development of spatial habits of mind. However, um, we did identify a really strong and striking correlation between whole brain modularity and GPA. So this analysis considered the full sample of participants, so people that were in the specialized course and those that were not. Um, but this was also observed almost the same kind of relationship for just the students in the intervention group. So this plot here is simply the zero order correlation between modularity and GPA. But modularity remained a significant predictor of GPA in a fairly stringent linear regression model in which we controlled for demographic information in scanner motion, as well as other measures of functional connectivity. So while our findings seem to be inconsistent with work that is described in association between modularity and intervention related gains, these findings do suggest a possible connection with academic achievement. Okay, so uh, to summarize, uh, we found that modularity was higher at rest than during the task, which suggests there may be some sort of reconfiguration of the network organization in the presence of task demands. We did not find that modularity was associated with learning in the intervention group of students, but we did find a strong correlation, um, which remains significant in a regression model between modularity and GPA. So together, these findings provide some novel insights into the network principles of brain organization that may or may not, may not 
uh, be relevant for classroom-based learning and achievement? There's a number of kind of open questions here, so I'm just gonna touch on a few of those very briefly. Again, happy to talk more about this later. So we found different associations between resting state modularity and task-based modularity as it relates to GPA. We didn't find a correlation between modularity at rest and with GPA. Um, but we also saw that modularity was higher at rest. So is the positive association then that we observe between the task-based modularity and GPA related to something like effort? You could imagine perhaps that students with higher GPAs maybe don't need to work quite as hard for kind of lack of a better word when they were doing the spatial reasoning problems. And maybe then they're kind of more closely related to the state they had when they were at rest, which could uh, manifest as a higher modularity. Um, modularity has also been previously tied to learning and intervention related gains. And some work has associated modular organization with assessments of general intelligence and memory. So learning, intelligence, memory, all of these constructs are likely to be closely related, but there may be some sort of dissociation between um, comparatively shorter interventions, which would be like the course that the students took, and something more long-term, which would be their GPA, which was averaged over three years prior to enrollment. Um, GPA, of course, is host to all kinds of additional factors, um, motivation, attendance, effort, all these things could be influencing GPA. So any combination of these and other variables could also be explaining uh, the association we found. And uh, finally, another important point to note is that the analyses I presented today are basically assuming a linear relationship between modularity and the um, dependent variables. But one could imagine that it's possible that maybe that isn't right. If you think of like a hypothetical case where someone would have an entirely unmodular brain with no overarching principles at all. And then kind of the other extreme where maybe there's a brain, I mean, these brains don't actually exist, but for a thought exercise, if there's a, a brain that's completely modular and absolutely no cross communication between the different communities, neither of those cases would probably be ideal. So we may be looking at something more of like a, there's a sweet spot between high and low, um, which would influence the analyses that we were doing. Um, so thus, there's clearly far more work that's needed to kind of get at this nature and the utility of modularity as it pertains to learning, but um, this is what we had in this data set. So thank you. All right. Terrific. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, uh, one is, uh, was brain size controlled for? Uh, it correlates about 0 0.40 with IQ. So it could be right. an important effect here. Yeah, so that ha we have that data. We have sort of like structural data. I don't know if we necessarily have that available, but um, that is that's a good question. I should kind of, I should take a look at that. I mean, anytime you're talking about the functional connections, there's always the underlying structural connections, which are, you know, a big part of that, uh, which ideally you'd be able to incorporate into your analyses. But that's a good question. I think a similar question is uh, interesting work. Was density strength of functional networks correlated with Q slash included as a covariate? Yeah, so that was something that we included as, as a covariate in the, uh, I can go back here. So um, that was when I had said like lower level kind of network principles that are driving the modularity calculation but aren't inherently the thing we're asking. So uh, density was included as a covariate. And I think there was a lot of these, because kind of all these different um, network features are part of the modularity um, question, I, there was an association between something like that and uh, the GPA as well, which is why we wanted to control for it. Uh, have you looked into other network science measures such as average shortest path length for quantifying interconnectivity between nodes or modules in the network? Yes, so we've looked at that. I've looked at um, like centrality and kind of hubbiness of some of the nodes, specifically like the spatial network, which was relevant for the task. We've considered maybe the spatially um, involved brain regions maybe take on more of a central role. We didn't see anything with that question. We also have applied more like dynamic uh, connectivity analyses. So thinking about things like um, flexibility and changes over the course in the scan, uh, course of the time in the scan. And, you know, some of those are coming out, some of those aren't. 
modularity was kind of the one I thought for the purposes of a 10 minute talk was like the cleanest uh, explanation. But yes, we've also considered a lot of other network measures. And I think probably as you would expect, some seem to be consistent with this and some are giving up, um, you know, no results. So let me ask one final, more general question. You know, this whole question of how, uh, how we think about the brain, the extent to which it's modular and the extent to which it's massively distributed is a conversation that's been going on for 150 years, right? At the second half of the 19th century, among neurologists, this was a big topic uh, and people varied. And over the years, the metaphors by which people discuss this is influenced by the technology and the statistical methods available at the time, right? What the technological metaphors uh, were. Uh, and what for me is cool about this is that this actually moves the, the conversation forward, not to from whether uh, the organization is modular versus distributed to individual differences in degree of modularity and degree of distributedness, right? So for me, that feels like it's shifting the, the 150 year old debate in a, in a useful fashion. The one question I have is around GPA, which is it's a very specific kind of measure. And you know, thinking about ideas of fluid and crystalline intelligence, is it the case that I'm just completely speculating? One could imagine modularity is good for crystalline intelligence and more distributed organization for fluid intelligence. And GPA maybe is measuring, you know, you gotta know the answer on your multiple choice, right? It's that kind of performance or achievement that's being looked at. Uh, do you think there's anything to this idea that in this individual difference between degree of modularity and dis distributed nature, the kinds of achievements that one might have might vary depending on what your achievement dependent measure is? Yeah, I think that's right. And I, I, I don't know the authors off the top of my head, but I know there was a paper fairly recently that came out that basically asked that question or at least trying to take like a shared, uh, like one measure of, I don't know if it was modularity or something else, but one uh, network-based measure of the brain and see how it kind of differentially relates to different measures that we traditionally think of as like G. Um, and it, I don't, again, I, don't, I need to refresh myself on what the paper was, but it, the findings were along the lines of what you are suggesting, that it, was, it wasn't the same for kind of all these different domains. So yeah, and whether you know more or less modularity varies based on the kind of intelligence that we might be talking about, I think it's very reasonable to think that that would be the case. All right, great, thanks, Adam. Uh, yeah. And now it's my pleasure to turn mm -hmm. it over to James, uh, so we can all flourish. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt John. I appreciate it, uh, uh, Alex and Adam. Great job uh, starting us off. Uh, boy, each of you were able to say a lot in 10 minutes clearly. <laughs> if we only all could aspire to such communication, we would be in good state. Um, so the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project uh, has been um, going uh, formally, I guess, since our first grant in uh, 2014. And if you think of human flourishing, it's a botanical metaphor for from the flourishing of plants uh, when plants are uh, blossoming, doing well, growing, and uh, so forth. Um, and it turns out that um, culture is also a botanical metaphor. So culture comes from the uh, Latin word cultivate. So if you cultivate your land successfully, then the plants should flourish. So if we take those terms now and thinking about the human world, then if we're interested in human flourishing, then one way in which we might get to human flourishing is through culture. And when uh, culture is um, uh, uh, experienced and created and developed and applied successfully, it should result in human flourishing of individuals, uh, of groups, of society in general. So the way we define then the positive humanities uh, is uh, the, the, the humanities in general are defined by the Oxford 
English dictionary as the branch of learning concerned with human culture. And so we define the positive humanities as the branch of learning concerned with human culture in its relation to human flourishing. Now, thinking about the connection between culture and human flourishing is probably not difficult. I'm sure that each one of us uh, have our music lists, have our favorite movies, perhaps our favorite uh, poetry, novels, works of art, and so forth. And we hopefully have time to uh, turn to those and to rely on those for our own flourishing uh, in our daily lives. It's important though to have more than just anecdotal evidence. How do we know when uh, elements of culture result in flourishing in what different kinds of ways? Well, as questions of assessment have arisen with the humanities and culture in general, uh, they've largely focused initially on extrinsic instrumental value. So what is the economic value of the movie industry or of the British museums, for example? Uh, they've also asked questions about vocational value. So if you major in the humanities, can you get a job? And if you do get a job, will you make as much as people who majored in physics or in engineering? Um, they've also been the subject of measurement in the classroom, for example. So what is your grade? What is your GPA uh, in taking these kinds of classes? Now, it's important to know the economic and the vocational and the academic outcomes and impacts of the humanities, but that's not why we have arts and culture in the first place, right? We have arts and culture in the first place because they have a eudaimonic connection to us. They're connected to our own flourishing, our own well-being. So the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project is interested in part in focusing on the assessment of the intrinsic benefits of participation, engagement in arts and culture. So things like personal enjoyment, flow states, uh, other kinds of positive emotions, uh, for example, uh, individual and societal growth. So ways in which they can help us develop our identity as individuals or connect with other people or become more aware of opportunities for growth uh, as a society, for example, in terms of equity and social justice. Um, and then finally, in terms of meaning making. So how do we make sense of this world in which we live? What are the narratives that can help us to understand uh, the world and our place in it? So these are just a few of many of the intrinsic benefits that might arise from engagement in, the, uh, in arts and culture, arise from the positive humanities. So I'm delighted that today we get to hear from two of our team members uh, talking about some of their research uh, as it relates to the work of the Humanities and Human Flourishing uh, Project. So first of all, we will hear from Damien Crone. Damien received his PhD from the University of Melbourne uh, last year and uh, working in the area of moral psychology. Uh, he also has uh, a significant training in neuroscience um, and um, we're delighted that he has been with us now for about the last year, a little over a year, I guess now, um, and is particularly working on um, data science approaches to questions in the domain of the humanities and human flourishing. So Damien, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, James. Let me just take a look at my slides ready. So hopefully you can all see that. So uh, what I'm presenting today is a cross-cultural analysis of the well-being correlates of artistic interests, um, with the caveat that some of the analyses and interpretations you'll be seeing today are just a few hours old. Um, so please bear with me. Um, so I'll start with what are probably three very familiar perspectives on the arts and humanities and the public discourse that have motivated this research. And so those are that the arts and humanities are unequivocally, unequivocally good for well-being. That they're also not worth investing in, and also that they're a luxury for the privileged. Now, obviously, these three things can't all be true. So this is pretty much what motivated the, the study that I'm presenting to you here. So what we're asking is, are arts and humanities related interests uh, or creative values or vocations consistently associated with metrics of well-being across cultures and across socio-demographic groups? So to address this question, uh, we, we are using uh, 
pre-existing data from the World Values Survey, specifically Wave 6 of the survey, which was conducted between 2010 and 2014. Um, and the analyses that we'll be uh, going through involve uh, between 22,000 and 86,000 participants from between 21 and 60 different nations. Um, and so in this data set, there are three well-being related outcomes that we're interested in. Um, so first of all, a measure of happiness, a measure of life satisfaction, and a, a measure of meaning in life. One caveat that I'll note about the meaning in life measure, so I have the question wording right there. You can see that this specific question is about how often people think about meaning as opposed to how, how much they experience the presence of meaning in their lives. So that's uh, one caveat to keep in mind as I proceed. Um, so those are the three outcomes we're interested in. We also have three uh, sort of broadly arts-related predictors that we're interested in examining. So there's uh, an item from a Big Five questionnaire uh, where people rate the extent to which they have artistic interests. Uh, there's a measure of uh, creative values um, and a measure of the extent to which people's uh, work uh, typically involve creative tasks. Um, I mentioned we're interested in examining associations between these variables while taking into account various socio-demographic factors. So the factors that we're considering here are measures of class, uh, people's satisfaction with their financial situation, um, their income, and their levels of education. So to analyze this data, we use multi-level models, um, which briefly basically allow you to take into account people and nations at the same time. So essentially that means uh, individuals from the same nation are on average going to be more similar to each other than they will be uh, to people from other nations. Um, the analyses that we run allow us to take into account contextual variation in associations uh, across nations. So for example, you could imagine uh, creative values might be positively associated with happiness in one country, might be negatively associated in another country, and there might be no association at all uh, in yet another country. Um, these analyses also allow us to take into account interactions between the person and nation. So, for example, we can ask, are people with creative values happier on average? Or are people in creative nations happier on average? Or are people with creative values in nations that tend to emphasize creative values happier on average? Or do all three of these things hold? So for those that are familiar with multi-level models, a few technical details. Um, so for all of the variables, we estimated person and nation level effects and interactions between the two. The one exception to this is the socio-demographic variable of class because uh, nation level class is not really a meaningful variable. Uh, our analytic approach is pretty registered. Um, we focus our interpretation on models that use the uh, most complex random effect structure feasible. Um, but also because we estimate a number of different kinds of models with uh, the same associations, we do uh, examine consistency across multiple models. So I'll just talk you through uh, the, the way the results are going to be presented. Um, so first of all, uh, well, given that there are three uh, outcomes and three predictors that we are interested in, that is more than I'll be able to fit in the remaining five minutes that I have. So I'll just say that I'm going to focus on the association between creative values and our three outcomes of interest. Um, so what you're looking at here is a multi-level model that is just predicting happiness from creative values at both the uh, individual, individual level, the nation level, and the interaction between the two. Um, and so you can see here is the unstandardized parameter estimate, um, which is positive and significant. So this suggests that uh, the more creative, the more an individual endorses creative values across, uh, well, the more an individual endorses creative values, the greater happiness they report. Um, and this is a consistent association across nations. Um, these three models here are testing the same thing, but also including um, additional, uh, the other two arts related predictors. Uh, including the socio-demographic factors and including all uh, variables at once. So the important thing to notice here is that that individual level positive association between creative values and happiness uh, holds in all of these models. 
Um, so to give you a little bit more of a concrete view of what that model suggests, I'm going to show you four different plots that correspond to those four different models, um, presenting the, the model's prediction for the association between creative values and happiness. So here we have uh, just the model with uh, creative, uh, creative values predicting happiness. Um, and so each line corresponds to the estimated effect for either a nation with average level creative value. So that's the blue line in the middle. Uh, a nation that strongly endorses creative values, uh, which is the green line, and a nation which uh, has relatively lower endorsement of creative values. Um, the important thing to see there is that the lines all trend in the same direction. Um, there's a positive association between creative values and happiness that doesn't seem to vary across countries. Uh, and this pattern broadly holds across the alternative models that include different sets of predictors. Uh, I mentioned that we tested a lot of different models. So as a sort of robustness check, we uh, examine each parameter estimate from 40 or so models. So the uh, the points you are looking at here are each the individual level parameter estimate for the association between individual level creative values and happiness. Uh, and you can see that the parameter estimates are all positive and significant across the 40 or so models. Uh, and for the uh, level two model, uh, the level two parameter estimates and the cross level interactions, they tend to be non significant uh, across all different models. So I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'll very quickly uh, run through the other two outcome variables. So the second outcome variable we had was satisfaction with life. And what you can see here is a very similar pattern. So creative values are positively associated with satisfaction with life uh, for uh, all, all, each of these four sets of models. Um, only at the individual level, um, we don't seem to observe any such effects at the nation level or any interaction between the two. Um, so once again, these are just the plots of the model predictions. You can see fairly consistent effects uh, across all different models, across different uh, across nations varying in their endorsement of creative values. Uh, once again, the, the parameter estimates are fairly consistent across all the different models. Finally, uh, looking at the association between endorsement of creative values and time spent thinking about meaning in life. Once again, we have a very similar pattern, uh, positive significant effects for creative values. Uh, one thing uh, worth noting here is that we have a positive cross-level interaction, but this only holds for one of the four models that I'm presenting, so perhaps best not to read too much into this. Uh, in terms of the way that plays out in the model predictions, you can see that it suggests that uh, this interaction effect would suggest that People in uh, nations that tend to emphasize creative values tend to experience a greater benefit uh, in terms of thinking about meaning life compared to nations that endorse creative values relatively less. Uh, again, these parameter estimates are fairly consistent across the different forms. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go through the other analyses, um, but there are a couple of things that might be worth taking up in the, the discussion. Um, but I will note that, um, so there is uh, one, so we did pre-register our analysis plan, but we ran into one uh, unanticipated limitation here, which was substantial missingness for one of the variables that we uh, were going to focus our analysis on. So the artistic interest variable turned out to only have data available in 22 out of the 60 nations. Um, so for any variable that, uh, for any model that included artistic interests as a predictor, that limited our analyses to only 22 out of the 60 nations, uh, leaving us with about a third or a quarter of the, the data that we we're expecting to have. Uh, but just to summarize, uh, what we find at the individual level is a consistent pattern of positive associations between creative values and the three indicators of well-being. Uh, less clear are the results for artistic interests and creative work. Um, as I mentioned, the, uh, the analyses of the uh, nation level effects and cross level interactions are somewhat more complicated than we had hoped, but that's something that we're looking into at the moment. Uh, in terms of future steps, uh, we are planning on looking at uh, interactions between some of these different predictors. So for example, looking at how demographic factors such as income. 
Uh, and we've also started looking into um, other data sets that might be able to sort of corroborate some of the, the analyses that we've run here. Um, but that's basically it. Uh, so thank you for listening. Great. Thank you, Damien. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to add them um, to the chat. Uh, Damien, one question. Can you just remind us what the happiness factor was? What, what were they looking at in particular? How did they define happiness? Um, so it was uh, just people raising, I think it was the, uh, how, how often, I mean, just get the question up. Uh, so the question is, taking all things together, would you say you are, as one to four scale, uh, not at all happy to have Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in through the chat. Uh, first of all, uh, from Sydney, were there items assessing consumption of the arts or were arts related predictors mainly about creative production? Uh, unfortunately, there weren't items in this particular survey about consumption of the arts. Um, there were a couple of things that were sort of in the ballpark so I think there was an item asking people if they were members of certain kinds of organizations. And I think artistic organizations might have been uh, included in one of the questions, but that was sort of lumped in with other things. So it might have been like, are you a member of uh, artistic or educational organizations? In which case that's sort of confounded with uh, membership of educational organizations. So in short, there wasn't really uh, a great uh, question that could get uh, consumption of the arts in this data set. Uh, I think when I was poking around looking at other publicly available data sets, there might have been uh, one or two that I came across that might have questions that can address those. Uh, so hopefully that's something that we'll, we'll be able to look, at, uh, look into in the future. Great. Uh, Alex wants to know if you have any thoughts on the mechanisms of why creative values is coming through for these positive well-being outcomes. Um, that is a good question, and it's not one that I have thought up a good answer for yet. Um, so, I, hmm. yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, so, in in some discussion that James and I had, we were we were sort of speculating on whether we might observe these effects in uh, specific contexts where sort of uh creativity is more valued and conformity relatively less valued um but uh if such were the case we might expect to find uh more variation across nations and less of a sort of consistent individual level effect across nations um but yeah this is something that we'll be uh thinking about um, as we sort of clarify the interpretation of these results so ask us your question again in a few months, Alex, and we'll have a really good answer by then. Uh, good, great question, thank you. And Anjan is interested uh, to know, in addition to income, do you think relative income inequality across nations plays a role? So Anjan, are you talking about within country income inequality or, or between, between countries? Uh, between. Uh, so okay. wondering whether, you know, you, if two countries have the same uh, mean income, but one country has widely mm -hmm. dispersed, uh, the upper and lower uh, groups are much more widely dispersed. Uh, so you could imagine the US versus Scandinavian countries, right? Like this. Yeah. Um, I I would, well, so I'm not sure how that would, I don't have a solid idea of how that might affect the association between the artistic or creative, uh, creativity related variables and well being. I imagine uh, lower income inequality would attenuate the associations between like any sort of individual level demographic factors. So, you know, if you're living in a very equal, like a country with very equal income distributions, it probably doesn't matter much where you are in the sort of income hierarchy uh, in terms of the association um, between sort of these variables and well-being. 
Great. Thank you, Damien. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we will now turn to our final speaker of this uh, session. Uh, so Catherine Cotter uh, has uh, completed her PhD also at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, also working uh, with Dr. Paul Sil uh, Silvia. She completed this, a dissertation on mental control of musical imagery, combining behavioral and experience sampling approaches. And indeed, uh, she is specializing in experience sampling approaches, um, using them in a variety of contexts relevant to the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project. I believe today she's going to talk to us about some of the work that she's been, been doing in a museum context, which is uh, uh, work that she will also be uh, continuing uh, in her time uh, here at Penn as well. So, uh, Catherine, welcome. Hi, thanks, James. All right, let's get... That's okay. Is it showing up correctly? It is, yep. Okay, perfect. Um, I can never tell with these things. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you, James, for the introduction. I'll be presenting some work that I did um, prior to coming to Penn in collaboration with some folks at the University of Vienna. So I have to uh, give them a shout out. So uh, Matthew Pulowski, Ava Specker, and Anna Fekita. Um, we're, we're part of this project and we're kind of in the process of getting getting this and another piece of the project written up uh, for journals. And so I'll be talking about how we can think about the effects of art museum visitation through using a daily diary uh, framework. And so oftentimes when we approach thinking about visiting an art museum, it can feel very ephemeral and intangible. Um, and so in, in terms of research approaches, often we've taken usually one of two uh, slants. So either the motivations, uh, so what brings people to the museum? Why are they there? What are they hoping to get out of it? As well as the outcome. So what do people actually take away from these experiences? And so on the motivation end, we may be thinking, okay, are people there to learn? Um, is it just something, I'm in Paris, and so you're supposed to do the Louvre while you're in Paris. Is it just something to get your selfie with the famous artwork to prove that you had that experience? Or perhaps you're there to relax and recharge because the museum really provides a certain ambiance or a certain kind of mental headspace for you. Or perhaps you're just dragged along because somebody else on your trip wants to go and you're there not to annoy them. Um, on the other side of things, we can also think about, well, what are people actually taking away from these experiences? What are they getting out of them? And oftentimes when we think about this, some of the classic outcomes people are interested in are what emotional experiences are people having? Are they having positive emotional experiences, negative emotional experiences, mixed emotions? Um, are they satisfied with what they had during their visit and how long did they stay? Um, did they like what they were seeing? Did they prefer the type of artworks they were um, looking at? And more recently, are their health and well-being benefits or outcomes relating to health and well-being that people take away from this. And so um, something that the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project is interested in this project kind of ties in nicely with um, is if we think about outcomes that are related to health and well-being, there's become this increasing interest in how can we leverage these outcomes and knowledge that there could be these benefits into becoming motivators for going to the museum. So going to the museum with the purpose of improving your health and well-being. Similarly to how you may start exercising or altering your diet with the goal of increasing your health and well-being. It can be a motivator, not just an outcome of a behavior. And so if we think about the realm of art museums, health and well-being, there have been a number of government and private agency and foundation reports um, in the past 20 years or so really examining, well, what can the arts give us in terms of health and well-being? Can they benefit us in some manner? Can these, in these processes, these experiences be beneficial to us? Um, and one such thing that's become more and more popular is this idea of social prescribing. And so Museums on Prescription is a project in the few, a few years old uh, in the UK that was started to look at the benefits to older adults through a program of arts engagement in museum. And more uh, contemporarily and more widespread now is the idea of arts on prescription. Um, that show health and well-being benefits and also a return on social investment. And so in these programs, essentially you go to your doctor, your general practitioner, and they can say, 
okay, my prescription for you is to go engage in the arts and go to the museum. And that will help alleviate some of your systems in theory. Um, and so this is like a new, new realm of, of research that hasn't gotten as much empirical work, but there has been some empirical work looking at really like specialized groups. So looking at the benefits for dementia patient, uh, patients, um, how we can see mood and self-esteem improvements in veterans and redu reduction in social isolation and increases in well-being in older adults through these art museum engagement experiences. However, a lot of this work really uses a reduction of the bad model. So how can, so for example, how can we really reduce depression systems, uh, symptoms uh, rather than a flourishing model? So how can we promote the good? Um, and so therefore most work has focused on clinical or at risk populations. Can we benefit these specific populations? And so an open question is, are there benefits for museum visits for non-clinical or non-at-risk populations? So in a normative sample, are there benefits? Are they similar benefits um, to what we may see in clinical populations? And can we leverage these experiences to just generally being a good kind of healthy experience? And so for this project, we collaborated with the Dome Museum in Vienna. And they had curated this really interesting exhibit called Show Me Your Wound. And it was really curated to promote reflection, empathy, and understanding of immigrant and refugee populations. And it contained a combination of historical Christian art from the Steffensdom Cathedral collection, as well as contemporary artworks, some of which were commissioned for this particular um, exhibit. And so the museum was hoping that through experiencing and viewing this collection of art that people would reflect more upon their own experiences, would have a greater capacity for empathy, and would begin to kind of take perspectives of others and kind of recognize that their experience is not universal. And so we wanted to see related to this, can we see some shifts in these types of well-being um, and health-related outcomes? And so we had a sample of psychology students who participated in two weeks of daily diaries. And so basically each evening for a week before their museum visit, they completed a diary on a set of questions. So a questionnaire diary. They visited the museum, completed a questionnaire that evening, and then for a week subsequent to their visit to this particular exhibit. So we could kind of get a baseline of what these uh, variables look like before they visit the museum, that day of the visit, did anything change, as well as how long did any changes um, last for, if they did. And so the surveys were quite long, but I'm just gonna focus on three kind of dimensions for the purposes of this talk. And so we asked them about their emotions, so to what extent they uh, felt a number of emotions on that given day. Uh, their quality of life, so how satisfied they were across a number of different dimensions of their life. Um, so overall life satisfaction, satisfaction with uh, their family relationship with significant others, so both romantic and platonic relationships, as well as their ability to help others. And finally, because the museum was most interested in empathy, how well they felt they were able to kind of take empathetic uh, perspectives on that day. All right, so just got a couple minutes left to get you through the results. And so first, um, I'll talk about the emotional, uh, daily emotional reports. And so um, here will be kind of the baseline. So what did people look like um, before they visited the museum? Were there any changes on the day of the museum visit? So in that evening, were there shifts in their emotional experiences, as well as did any changes or shifts last a day beyond the visit? So in the short term, did anything happen and did it last at all? And so first we see that for jealousy, people were less jealous than they were the week prior on the day that they visited the museum, but that difference dissipated a day later. So that jealousy effect did not uh, last. People showed no changes in how grateful they were feeling, how content they were, how guilty they felt, or how stressed they were. So not a whole lot of differences in their emotional experiences as a result of this initial visit. Um, we can also think about this in a longer time scale. So because people also completed these surveys for a full week after their visit, we can also see how the week before compared to the week after their visit. And so here we see no effects for jealousy, so there are no differences in jealousy, feeling grateful, feeling content, feeling guilty, 
or stressed. So basically this museum visit did not shift their daily emotional routine. They were still pretty much the same before and after that visit. If we think about their quality of life, so again, this was how satisfied they were with these different domains of their life. Again, the week before the visit, the day of the visit, as well as the day following the visit. Uh, we can see people's satisfaction with their life overall increased the day of the visit and did not significantly decrease the day after. So it seems like that peak held for at least one day. Um, similarly, people were more satisfied with their family relationships on the day of the visit. And again, that did not dissipate immediate, uh, immediately the day after um, for their satisfaction with their significant others. Again, increased the day of the visit and unfortunately decreased the day after. And interestingly, there was no changes in their satisfaction with their ability to help others the day of the visit or immediately after. If we think in terms of the longer time scale, um, there is no change overall in their overall life satisfaction, satisfaction with family relationships, with their significant other, but we did see a slight uptick in their satisfaction with their ability to help others. Finally, with empathy, uh, there were no changes at all in people's um, reported ability to uh, take the perspectives of others. Um, they did feel more concerned for the less fortunate the day of the visit, but this again decreased the day following the museum visit. And they were also able to report feeling what others do more strongly the day of the visit, but again, this dissipated the day after the visit. If we look in a longer time scale, um, again, taking others' perspective showed no change in the longer scale, as well as concern for less fortunate or feeling what others do. So in terms of takeaways, it looked like for people's daily emotional reports, there wasn't that much change in emotion. Um, so there were, so although people had emotional experiences in the museum, it didn't seem to shift their daily emotional tenor. In terms of quality of life, it does show that some aspects of quality of life did shift, but generally these shifts were only short term. Um, their satisfaction with their ability to help others was the only one that might have shown longer effects, but it's important to note we didn't actually measure helping behavior, just their satisfaction with their ability to help others. And finally, with empathy, um, this showed the largest day of effects or day of visit effects, but these also quickly dissipated the day after and sh didn't show any sustained change. Um, so generally, this may suggest that our engagement can promote changes in well-being, at least in the short term. And so in the future work, we should look at dosage effects. So this was just one exhibit. So if it was a longer experience, would this have looked any different, um, as well as the effects of multiple visits. But this does show some initial evidence that we may be able to target specific aspects of well-being through an art visit to change some of these factors. All right. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Catherine. Fascinating study. Um, I think uh, it would be nice if all of us were able to go through the exhibit at the Stefan School mm. and to you know, get the full effect of what your research was. Um, yeah. So uh, a mm -hmm. few questions um, that are coming in through all the right. chat. Um, sure. First of all, uh, Tan wants to know uh, why were these particular emotions picked in the study? Um, so we actually measured about 20 different emotions at the uh, Daily Diaries. This was just a small subset for this particular presentation. Um, so as part of our collaboration with the museum, they identified some particular emotions that they were most interested in conveying, um, as well as I kind of went through the list for the purposes of this presentation um, to find some that kind of resonated kind of across the board of the type of emotions that we measured in terms of positive and negative affectivity, as well as ones that were a little bit more relevant to the contents of the exhibit. Cool. Uh, Sydney wants to know, was liking slash enjoyment of the exhibit itself assessed? It was, it has not yet been analyzed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the, the broader scale of this, people were in the lab before they, they went to the museum. They did a lengthy survey immediately after the museum visit. They did a couple follow-up surveys. Um, here I'm just looking at the, the daily life kind of component. So there, 
it's a larger scale study that like Adam mentioned, you have to kind of pare down for a, for a 10 minute presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, great. So I'll ask one final question and then we'll have just a few minutes for general discussion. So uh, anybody who would like to uh, chime in uh, with general questions, uh, feel free to do so uh, in our final few minutes. Actually, Anjan just had another question as well for you, okay. Catherine. Were their visits sure. curated? So how long before which artworks they visited and all that kind of stuff? Uh, no, so they were just asked to visit the museum uh, within the span of a certain number of days, depending on when they were enrolled in the study. And then they went independently to the museum um, and then were just taken to that particular exhibition room so that they were only viewing that particular exhibit. Um, but their behavior in the exhibit was entirely their own. They could stay for five minutes, they could stay for five hours. Um, if they wanted to ask docent questions, they could, but none of that was um, restricted. Cool, so Catherine, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you distinguished uh, between uh, intentions and outcomes, which I think was really important. Um, I seem to recall that the intentions that you were looking at there perhaps were mostly on the part of the visitors, although I could have that wrong. Um, I'm curious if you could say more about uh, what you just alluded to at the very end uh, about what, how we might take this, these outcomes and build on them for longer lasting shifts and changes. Um, so I'm thinking particularly about the intentions from the standpoint of the institution, of the museum itself. So um, my understanding is that you took an, uh, a, a, um, an exhibit which had certain intentions around immigrants and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, but but it would be interesting, right? Maybe I'll just ask my question the following way. What do you think could be done? Let's say that you reported this to the curators and they had a chance to reconfigure their exhibit in some way um, to try to optimize the outcomes that they were looking for in light of your evidence. What couple things might you suggest that they might do uh, to, to, to get greater outcomes? Sure, so I think for, for this particular exhibit, they were really, really pushing the empathy and understanding piece. And that's where we saw those largest immediate effects. They didn't last, but they were the largest effects that we did see. So the largest changes we were seeing. Um, so I think part of it is just identifying the outcome that you want. Um, so I think a lot of times there are these kind of general outcomes that we hope. We hope people are satisfied with their visit, um, feel more relaxed after their visit, and are just ha hoping for that more generally. And so I think something institutions could do is um, even on like an exhibit level is focus on, well, we hope this room will convey something like empathy or will convey something like relaxation. I know um, in the COVID times, a lot of museums are rethinking to have like a relaxation or a, like a de-stress type of room. And so there are a lot of things that can be done to do this. It can be having a specific type of tour that goes through that room that people can engage in or a workshop to really hone in on um, some other mechanisms or other properties um, that would further that cost towards a, a particular outcome. But I think the important piece is to clearly identify a specific outcome that's of interest rather than perhaps these broader ones that I think are tending to be more of the, the norm. It's, we hope people will relax and enjoy it, mm -hmm. but those are pretty broad in general. Yeah, cool. Um, great. So again, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I see Tan has one more question for you, Catherine, which I think is really connected to a question that was posed of Damien around mechanisms. So one of the mechanisms <laughs> that we've hypothesized and that has emerged uh, so far from our literature reviews and our work of various sorts is that um, uh, immersion seems to be an important mechanism. And, and it makes sense because if you're not paying attention, it's like unlikely you're going to be changed mm -hmm. in some way, right? Um, and so do you think, Catherine, that further um, information about the artwork itself could be a way of helping people to get inside that work? Maybe learning more about the artist, learning more about the motivations and so forth, just any kind of way that you can get further attention, further focus, further immersion may perhaps open up a window for longer term outcomes, longer lasting outcomes? 
Yeah, I think, I think just what you're saying is giving particular information can be very helpful because I can just think of some different museums I've been to or even within the same room um, of artwork. Some have really lengthy uh, descriptive text and some are just, here's the artist, the year it was made and the materials. And so when you hear the story of the particular artist or their inspiration for a particular artwork, it gives you a new perspective on, on that piece. And so something else museums can always consider is um, through apps or audio tours or other technology is having those gear towards, okay, you want to relax, here's like the relax tour and it gives you extra information about different things. And so, or there's like the immersion tour, I know there's some really great workshops on like the art of looking and so how to really deeply and meaningfully like view an artwork rather than kind of the skimming we tend to do. So I think some really great work by um, Jeff and Lisa Smith is something like 20 seconds per artwork is like the norm. And if you're there over a minute, it's like very unusual and very weird. Yeah. Um, so if we think about like immersion as a mechanism, people aren't generally being so immersed in a museum. They're just kind of skimming be like, okay, that looked nice and then keep going, so. Yeah. Cool, thank you, Catherine. I see that we're approaching uh, the end of our time. So I'll just say a few things and then Anjan, I'll turn it over to you for the last word. Um, First of all, just thank you to each of the presenters. What a really fascinating um, time uh, here. So please uh, join me in thanking them. Um, this is the, virtu the virtual version of thunderous applause. So just so you know uh, how much we appreciated uh, your, your work. Um, it's great to see that people with this kind of uh, expertise and experience um, and perspective are coming into uh, the pen context and uh, really looking forward to uh, hopefully, on John, we'll be able to do this on somewhat of a regular basis um, and find out, uh, you know, and hear about what the work is that you have done specifically oriented towards the work at the uh, Penn Center for Neuroaesthetics or the Humanities and Immigration Project, given these domains of expertise. Uh, and of course, we're also uh, looking for ways in which we can bring our areas of interest uh, together. I know I see uh, Vera Ludwig is also here. Vera, nice to see you from Michael Platt's lab. Um, and so we're really interested in expanding the, um, both the information exchange, uh, but also the possibilities for collaboration uh, uh, during, uh, during your time here. So uh, welcome to Penn. Thank you for the great uh, presentation and we're really looking forward uh, to the continued uh, collaboration. So with that, Anjan, over to you. Um, I don't really have that much to add. Uh, I want to thank the speakers uh, again uh, for uh, being so uh, concise and communicating the information, which is great. Uh, you know, it's probably because you guys aren't full professors because they can never shut up. Um, but, um, you know, the I do want to make just one point for uh, trainees and students uh, and this certainly applies to neuroaesthetics, but and I suspect applies to positive psychology and human flourishing, which is um, what I tell often in my talks, I tell students is that these are such early fields that uh, the big questions, the low hanging fruit are still just out there waiting to be plucked. Like this is, these are not fields you go into and you're sort of, you know, debating minutia. So I, it makes it, it makes it really a pretty exciting place to be uh, as my pitch for these fields in general. So, and I'll leave it at that. Terrific. Well, thanks on John. I want to say a huge thank you to Sarah Sadoti as well, who helped to organize this. Uh, again, thanks to uh, all the presenters and thanks to you, uh, the participants who came and, um, and joined us. It would have been fairly awkward had we had an empty virtual room. So thank you for being here. We look forward to much more and um, take care, be well, um, take care of that brain you have and uh, get, some, uh, get some connection to culture and some human flourishing at some point this week. All right, take care everybody, be well, thank you.